Hello, a warm welcome to CrestBD's Bipolar Wellness Center webinar series. This webinar will provide you with a summary of current research evidence on the relationship between cognition and quality of life, as well as pointing you to some tools and resources to help you flourish in your cognitive life. Hello, my name is Ivan Torres and welcome to this webinar. And during this webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, cognition and the relevance uh, that cognition has to individuals with bipolar disorder. And um, what we have here is a, a short outline that's covering some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. So that first we're going to do a, a, a brief definition of what cognition is and then we'll follow that up by talking about uh, the relevance of cognition to individuals with bipolar disorder and also why cognition is important to your quality of life and everyday functioning. And then we'll wrap this up with uh, the mention of a couple of tools and resources that are relevant to this topic. Okay, so um, the first thing I'd like to do is just uh, very briefly cover uh, what cognition is. And really this refers to the thinking skills and, and mental abilities that we use on a daily basis. Uh, so this would include things like our attention span, uh, concentration, ability to remember things, our ability to process information, solve problems, and engage in, in planning activities. Now, we know that we're all born with uh, different cognitive abilities, and each one of us has our own set of cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that cognitive skills can change across uh, an individual's life. Uh, we know that cognition has the potential to become worse with illness or with injury or even the process of normal aging. But there are also instances where cognitive abilities can be strengthened or improved as well. Now, there's been a great deal of research in the past 10 years or so looking at um, the importance of cognitive functioning with regard to bipolar disorder. And we now understand that um, that part of the illness is involves, um, you know, for, for many individuals, difficulties with uh, abilities like attention span, uh, learning, uh, verbal memory, and some aspects of problem solving and decision making. Um, and this is in addition to the typical mood symptoms that we usually associate with bipolar disorder. Now, another interesting finding is that not all individuals are affected similarly by these cognitive difficulties, su such that some patients may have very few cognitive difficulties, whereas others might have much more pronounced. So it's, not, it's something that's kind of um, you know, different across individuals. Now, we know that cognitive difficulties are most prominent in the midst of mood episodes. So this would be during periods of depression or periods of mania, where um, not surprisingly, we might expect that one's ability to concentrate on and focus would be more affected. Um, however, an important finding is that even when individuals are not in the midst of suffering uh, mood episodes, that one can still show cognitive difficulties. And so what we've come to understand is that we can think of cognition for many people with the illness as one of the primary or core symptoms. And it's really not just something that is secondary to mood symptoms, but rather a primary symptom that we should be paying attention to by itself. And of course, for the person with bipolar disorder, there are many potential factors that can contribute to how uh, prominent cognitive difficulties might be. So that would include things like aging. Um, so again, as we age, cognitive difficulties in memory and those kinds of skills tend to tend to decline to a certain degree. 
Um, also, the use of recreational drugs, alcohol, or substance abuse could also contribute to cognitive difficulties. And then there's the, the complex influence of medications, which we're just trying to understand the, the influences of medications. Um, it's probably the case that some of the medications that are used to treat bipolar disorder might have uh, more potential for producing side effects than other medications. So this is something to certainly discuss with your, with your healthcare providers and, and physicians. Um, the other issue with medications is that sometimes you can also get uh, interactions if a person is taking multiple medications, and, and sometimes the side effects can also be related to the dose of medications. So these are all multiple factors that, that have the potential to contribute to the cognitive problems that we might see in a person with bipolar disorder. And then, of course, there's other lifestyle kinds of factors, like, for example, if somebody experiences sleep problems, they might be more likely to have disruptions with attention, concentration, and thinking uh, during the day as well. So what is the relevance or the significance of having these cognitive lapses or cognitive challenges? And, and how is that important to quality of life? Um, well, as it turns out, research is indeed starting to show that some of these cognitive difficulties or challenges that some patients might experience could also be predictive of a person's quality of life or their daily functioning. So as we might imagine, if somebody's experiencing difficulties with memory or organization or attention span, that that has a potential to affect a variety of different spheres of daily functioning, such as independent living and functioning, you know, going to the grocery store, shopping, uh, taking care of paying bills. Um, obviously, another area where we really need to maximize our cognitive skills for optimal performance is in our work and educational lives. Um, also, cognitive difficulties can affect your leisure activities, such as planning events and, and engaging in those kinds of activities, and also in maintaining social relationships and roles, so that one's ability to you know, make plans with friends and to uh, meet up with, with uh, acquaintances and friends for appointments certainly requires some level of cognition and planning to engage in those kinds of activities. So how can you begin to take action if, in fact, um, you're one of the individuals that might be experiencing some of these cognitive challenges? Um, one important first step is to actually become educated, as you are in participating in this webinar, about the anticipation for the potential for cognitive difficulties. So that allows you the opportunity to be more in tune, to uh, have the chance to track any potential changes in memory, attention, alertness, or thinking. So just knowing that that could be part of the illness is important for individuals to be aware of. Um, it's also important to know that the cognitive changes or cognitive functions could also be affected by various factors, like, like the ones that we've already discussed, like medications or being in mood phases. So if one is experiencing a certain uh, mood episode, you might anticipate that you might have more difficulty with certain types of cognitive skills. Or likewise, if there's medication changes, that might also prompt changes in terms of cognitive abilities as well. The other important thing to keep in mind is that sometimes it's not easy for us as individuals to help track uh, how our cognitive functioning is doing. So it's important to engage other, others, including family members or other health professionals, to help us in the process of keeping track of these cognitive changes and alerting us to that. Again, because people are not always in the best position to do that on their own.
and and by uh, tracking your skills and thinking about uh, the possibility of, of these cognitive difficulties, it also allows you to empower your your ability to work with your healthcare team and to sort of take charge of helping to manage any potential cognitive difficulties that you might be experiencing related to medications or, or to your illness. Another component of that is that it's very important to be open with your healthcare team and professionals about any other kinds of factors that could influence your cognitive thinking, uh, cognitive functioning and thinking, such as the use of substances or use of other types of medications, and also the way that you're taking these kinds of medications. Now, if it turns out that you, and in conjunction with your healthcare team, it's decided that um, that the cognitive challenges that you're experiencing might be more significant or perhaps not just related to medication side effects, then another potential avenue for uh, dealing with these cognitive challenges would be to engage in cognitive rehabilitation strategies. And really what this refers to is a range of different activities that are geared toward helping or improving or restoring your cognitive functioning to a healthier state, okay? And usually when we talk about cognitive rehabilitation, there's several different uh, components that could go into a, a rehabilitation program. And so these would include what we would call remediation techniques. It would also include compensatory strategies. And the third one would be adaptive approaches. Um, now, the best way to understand which one of these might be most helpful for you would be with uh, obtaining an assessment by a, a qualified healthcare professional to help you decide which one of these approaches might be more appropriate for you. And so what I'd like to do next is just very briefly uh, discuss each one of these three types of techniques. So remediation techniques are all about an effort to try to improve the cognitive weaknesses that have been identified. So the analogy here would be if you have a weak muscle, the way to try to improve that muscle function is by exercising the muscle with drills and rep repetition and exercises. And so we might think of remediation techniques as a similar kind of set of procedures aimed at improving cognitive abilities like attention, memory, problem solving skills. So with these kinds of techniques, the focus is on um, engaging in repetitive drills or exercises, which often would involve computers, but not necessarily. They can also involve paper and pencil kinds of tasks or even be conducted in the context of group activities. Um, but again, the idea here is that by practicing the weak cognitive abilities that, you know, the goal there is to improve functioning in each of these uh, different types of abilities. Now, obviously in order to achieve some success with this, we expect that this takes quite a bit of hard work and effort, and this isn't something that we would anticipate that you're going to get improvements with overnight, um, but it is a strategy that uh, has been developed to try to improve these cognitive abilities. Now, the research to date on these remediation techniques is still in its infancy, but there are some preliminary findings that suggest that at least some individuals with bipolar disorder might benefit from remediation types of techniques. Um, the other issue uh, that is involved with evaluating the outcome of these remediation techniques is that um, whereas you might show improvements on the immediate task that you're working on, we're hoping that the improvements that you see 
go beyond the specific tasks that you're actually practicing. And again, there's quite a bit of research that's going on right now to understand uh, the degree to which these remediation techniques might improve not just the task that you're practicing, but also extend to improving functions that use these abilities in everyday life and functioning. The, the second type of rehabilitative technique is, is the use of compensatory strategies. And so the idea here is to try to identify a person's cognitive strengths as well as their weaknesses. And rather than trying to build up the weaknesses, what we're trying to accomplish here is to work on using the strengths that are identified to circumvent or to override the cognitive weaknesses. So here you're not so much trying to exercise the muscle that is affected, but rather you might be using a different set of muscles to try to do what the weak muscle can't do, just to use an analogy. And so the goal here is to help to identify different ways to accomplish a common goal and to use our strengths to compensate for the weaknesses to achieve these goals. And so if I could provide an example of one set of techniques that we would call a mnemonic technique or a memory aid, um, this might illustrate um, how we would uh, compensate for a weakness. So let's say that you're tasked, that you're engaged in an activity that we commonly do, and that's going to the grocery store to buy a few items. And on your list of items, you have milk, eggs, and butter. Now, the typical way that we would try to do this is to try to remember these three um, ingredients or these three uh, you know, grocery items in our memory as we go to the store. However, if you're experiencing memory difficulties, you might have difficulty with that task. And so another way that you could introduce a memory aid would be to come up with sort of a funny or unusual or atypical sentence that might serve to help boost your memory when you get into the shopping situation. So in this situation, you might come up with the sentence, my ear is blue, okay? And so when you consider the sentence, my, you take the first uh, letters of each word. So my would be an M, so that corresponds with milk. Ear is the eggs and blue is the butter. And so rather than trying to remember three different items, if you just remember this odd sentence, my ear is blue, then that might be a way to facilitate your memory once you get into the grocery store. So again, that's just a small example of a mnemonic or a memory aid that you can use to compensate for a possible uh, weakness in your memory functioning. Now, the third rehabilitative type of approach is the adaptive techniques. And really what this involves is not so much making a, a change within the person, but rather making change to the environment that the person is functioning within. And so commonly adaptive approaches would involve the use of external types of aids. Uh, so things like recording devices to help you keep track of information, uh, calendars, organizers, the use of um, alarms or reminders to help uh, cue us about uh, things that we have to keep track of in our daily life. Obviously, there's a lot of different apps that, uh, that one could use on their cell phones uh, to help with these kinds of activities. And again, uh, these are things that um, are in common use in daily life uh, for people with or without the, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So, but again, the, the fundamental strategy here is to use these external aids to help us with uh, performing the kinds of tasks that, that without these aids we would struggle with a bit more. And so 
what I'd like to do now is just uh, uh, wrap up this conversation with talking about some general tips uh, to recommend uh, that are important to keep in mind, especially when uh, a person is um, struggling or experiencing difficulties in one or multiple cognitive types of abilities. So the, the first general tip is to try to keep communication and activities simple, direct, and short. Okay, so that's really um, talking about trying to simplify activities and communications with others. Um, it's also important to keep activities to one thing at a time and to avoid multitasking or to do multiple things at one point because that takes a lot more mental energy and, and mental resources. And so if you find that you have to do multiple things in a given time period, it's usually more effective to try to take care of one thing at a time and then move on to the other task rather than trying to multitask and to do too many things at one, at one period. Another general uh, recommendation is to get plenty of rest because we know that uh, the onset of fatigue and, and, and feeling tired has the potential to make uh, cognitive functions even worse. And so you want to be sure to, in order to maximize your energy, le your mental energy level, to have plenty of rest uh, within your daily schedule. It's also important to limit distractions. Uh, you know, we all do much better when we're working in an environment that is uh, free of distractibility, that's less uh, chaotic, and where you can focus, again, on, on trying to work on one particular task. It's also important to, to balance uh, your, men, your, your activities that require a lot of mental effort with other types of activities that are more physically involved or socially involved. And, um, you know, if you, if you sort of balance the amount of uh, activities that you do in these different areas, you'll find that you're probably going to be functioning better in all these different areas rather than, for example, spending too much time on your cognitive uh, activities and then becoming less and less efficient uh, without having plenty of breaks. And then the very last recommendation is to try to keep activities um, and tasks structured and organized. And, and I think the, the best analogy for that would be, um, you know, how mess messy is your desk? Okay. And and for, for many of us, uh, we find that when our desks are cluttered and, and our minds are cluttered, that it's much more difficult to keep track of all the things that you really need to uh, take care of on a daily basis. Whereas if we organize things and prioritize things, um, we probably would do a much better job of being able to do the key things that we need to, to take care of in order to function in our daily lives. And so, what I'd like to do now in closing is to very briefly talk about uh, a couple of tools and, and potential resources um, for uh, you know, attempting to further understand the cognitive challenges that some individuals can face uh, who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, now, again, we're not quite at the point in terms of research where we can say we can make a very direct prescription about what a specific patient will need to improve their cognition. Um, we're really in, in a wave of, of research where a lot of these studies, you know, the very good news is that there's a lot of studies that are being conducted now um, that are trying to find either medical treatments or um, rehabilitative treatments that are particularly effective for uh, individuals with bipolar disorder. And so even though we don't have all the answers yet, there's a tremendous excitement and effort to target these cognitive abilities and to find the best ways that we can address them. Um, in the meantime, one of the things that one could, could do is to engage in some of these um, uh, brain training kinds of activities. There's a lot of different apps and um, websites that certainly promote these kinds of activities. 
again, the good news is that there's a lot of resources on the internet and places where you can go and practice your memory skills and so on. The not so good news is that the research hasn't been conducted yet to show, uh, you know, that we can recommend recommend a specific program or a specific set of abilities, although I think that's coming in the future. And so what I want to do is just present a couple of the more popular items uh, that, uh, that you might be exposed to. And so one of these tools is called Cognifit, which is an online uh, cognitive training program that, again, provides tools to measure a variety of different cognitive skills and uh, provides you the ability to improve these skills through a variety of different tasks and games. And, uh, and also, you have the possibility to track your own progress uh, in, in these kinds of abilities. So that's the Cognifit program. Um, there's also uh, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, popular programs out there is uh, Lumosity, which is, again, another online cognitive uh, brain training website that also uses interactive games and various activities to train uh, memory and attention. And you can come up with a personalized training program. Um, again, these are just two of many different types of um, programs that are out there that uh, you might be interested in, in, in checking out. Um, the, in, in, in looking at existing um, online uh, resources as well. One of the ones that we came across that we found extremely useful was um, a handbook that was put out uh, by the New York State government, and, and you can see the website below. And this is a handbook that was uh, written by two psychologists, um, Alice Medallia and Nadine Revheim. And again, this is a very nice, um, informative, um, educational um, handbook that provides a lot of rich information that sort of elaborates on some of the things that we've been talking about in this webinar. So I would encourage you to take a look at that and, and there's a lot of very good useful information there. And so um, what I'd like to do in closing is to also um, uh, make you aware of a couple of other links for important uh, resources having to do with uh, bipolar wellness. So you can visit the Bipolar Wellness Center. And, um, and if you're also interested in evaluating your quality of life, there's also a link to the uh, Quality of Life tool, uh, which is also uh, developed by Crest BD. Um, and here are uh, a couple of the other sponsors that have uh, sponsored this kind of work. So uh, thank you for participating in this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Torres, for that uh, wonderful and pragmatic webinar. Um, clearly, this is a topic of interest because we have questions flooding in. So let's crack on with those and move on to the question and answer part of today's presentation. So to the first of the questions, Dr. Torres, the participant asks, can you give a concrete example of a specific cognitive challenge and an example of some cognitive rehabilitation strategies that could be helpful in this example? Yeah, let me, let me elaborate on that. So obviously one of the main areas of interest to, to many individuals um, with bipolar disorder is the area of memory functioning. So if we could just sort of explore that in a little bit more depth. Um, we, can, we can maybe talk about more specifically the nature of, of the kinds of memory problems that we see and the kinds of rehabilitative strategies that we might take to, to address that. So, so to begin with, I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that not all memory problems are the same, okay? And that if we look at memory, that we can actually break that down into several different components. And, and for those of us uh, practicing in the field, we try to, um, you know, to, to figure out what components of, of moment memory are, are being affected with, with different individuals. And so one aspect of memory has to do with how well we can sort of 
initially learn or in, encode the information. And so it, when we're being exposed to material, um, if we're not able to pick this up very effectively, then chances are we're not going to be able to learn that and hold on to it across time. So that would be an example of an, what we would call an encoding or learning type of problem. And that is one kind of difficulty that some people with uh, bipolar disorder experience. Now, a more severe kind of memory problem would be what we would call uh, a retention-based problem. And in this situation, a person might be able to initially process information, but what they have difficulty with is putting this information into their long-term storage, okay? And so what would happen here is that somebody could initially demonstrate that they can, you know, understand material or process the information, but then after a period go goes by, if we ask them about that material, then they might have very little recollection of the memory. And that's actually an example of, of one of the more severe kinds of problems which you would see in some of the dementias, so some things like conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Now, the good news is that we don't tend to see that type of memory problem when we're talking about bipolar disorder. Um, the third component that, that is very relevant to bipolar disorder is what I would call a retrieval-based memory problem. And here, the difficulty is more in the person's ability to access the information that they've already learned. And this is a very kind of mem of, of co very common type of memory difficulty that we would see in bipolar disorder. And so what happens here is that a person may have been too exposed to information earlier, but now when they're being asked to remember that information, they have a tough time kind of coming up with the, you know, what it was that they were exposed to, coming up with the material. However, the key here is that um, the information is still in there, okay, it's still in their mind, it's just that the person is having a hard time accessing that information. And, and that's why we call it a retrieval-based memory difficulty. Um, and so, so I hope that that kind of paints a picture of, of different components of memory that we might be interested in looking at. Now, if, if we take the example of this retrieval-based memory difficulty and think about the, the rehabilitative strategies that we might undertake to help that kind of memory problem, then what really tends to help these folks is to provide retrieval kinds of cues or hints or reminders because these things tend to um, facilitate the person's ability to get to that information that they can't access, okay? And so in the clinic, the way that we would do that kind of thing is to not just ask somebody, you know, what it is that they remember, but if they fail those initial attempts, then we start giving them cues and reminders and, 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 and we usually find that people have a tendency to respond fairly well to those kinds of things because, again, the memories are still available. It's just that they're difficult to access. And so I hope that that gives kind of an example of, you know, a specific strategy, namely, you know, providing these external cues that we would use on a very specific kind of memory problem that one would present with. Very helpful. Thank you. The next two questions are dealing with medications and cognition. The first one asks, if cognitive problems are a primary symptom of bipolar disorder, do medications that treat bipolar disorder also reduce cognitive problems along with other symptoms? That's, that's an excellent question. And, um, you, you know, off the bat, when we're thinking about the effects of medications, I think it is important to think of the potential for both negative side effects on cognition but also for the potential of, you know, positive effects on, on cognition. And, um, and again, we're, we're, in terms of the research, we're not quite there yet in terms of being able to say, you know, these are the agents that we can expect to, um, you know, you know to, to treat a person with, and, and we expect that there's going to be 
cognitive improvements that are associated with this in a very direct way. And, and what I mean by that is that we know that if, if we give somebody, for example, mood stabilizers that are often aimed at treating acute uh, mood symptoms like depression or, or mania or hypomania, that one of the secondary byproducts of being treated with these medications is that by virtue of improving the mood symptoms that the cognitive symptoms that are associated with mood are also potentially going to be improved. So in a way you're getting, you know, uh, kind of double bang for your buck, okay? Um, now, in that instance, you know, you have the potential to help mood symptoms that are only associated or I'm sorry, cognitive symptoms that are only associated with the mood. And, and that's a positive thing. But what we would really like to get to is to get to the point where we can improve the cognitive symptoms that are present even when the mood symptoms are not there. Okay, And that's the place where we, we just haven't really gotten to the point where we can say, you know, drug A or drug B is going to be able to address those core symptoms that are that are present even when the mood symptoms are gone. So the bottom line is that the whole question of you know the effects of medications on cognition is a very complicated one because you know we have the potential for these secondary improvements but but the primary improvements that would affect the core cognitive deficits we don't, you know, we haven't been really good at, at, at figuring out ways to, to treat those kinds of problems. Um, and so, you know, I think in the coming years, I absolutely expect that we will have better answers to these questions. And then the questions being, you know, what are the specific both medical and non-medical treatments that we can, you know, in, in a sense prescribe that we know that research tells us will improve our, our cognitive functions. Mm, thank you. And the next question is a nice follow-on from that. It asks you specifically about medications um, that are most likely to affect cognitive functioning with a particular eye to medications that help sleep, sleep aids. And the person suggests that, you know, well, affecting sleep can help functioning overall, you know, are there side effects that could make functioning worse from the medication itself? So are we talking here about the medications for sleep or? Yeah. Or, or, okay. Um, you know, I, I think inherent in, in this question is, is the, the writer's recognition that, you know, on the one hand, the, the sleep medications are going to help with sleep, and that in itself is going to make you more alert and cognitively uh, functional. Okay, so so that is a very important point. Um, on the other hand, we also know that some uh, sleep medications do have the potential to provide some, uh, you know, at least mild sedative effects that could affect things like, uh, you know, reaction time and then response to, you know, to processing information. So. So, in a sense, we, we're, we're dealing with a situation where a medication, again, has the potential to be, um, you know, providing some improvement, you know, while at the same time has the potential to be, to be you know, exerting some side effects that, that would not be favorable. So, so, I think in instances like that, you know, it's important to talk to your um, to your medical uh, health professional, psychiatrist, physician, to to sort of help balance those those kinds of issues because, you know, for some, the effect of not having a good night's sleep might be much more overwhelming than mild sedative effects or potential sedative effects that could come from the the sleeping aids themselves. So in a, in a situation like that, I think it would be much more important to uh, address the sleep problems. Um, you know, to, to help that particular individual in, in maximizing their, their cognitive functioning. Thank you. The next question is about time zone changes. The participant notes that when she travels, particularly when she travels east, that she has problems with visual 
spatial orientation, map reading for a couple of days after arriving at her location. Do you have any feedback on that? Um, yeah, you know, my, my first thought about that is that, that I, I, I don't know that, you know, this kind of um, sort of effect or side effect, if you will, that we could we could call it that, I think, and use that term appropriately here, is, is probably something that may not be specific to bipolar. In other words, that's something that um, some people may have uh, sensitivities to time changes and it could be a bit disorienting and, and certainly kind of re wreak havoc with, uh, uh, you know, clarity of thinking and, and cognitive ability. Um, one thing that I that I found a little bit um, peculiar about the, the 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 question is that it seems like um, the cognitive difficulties that were described were were kind of more specifically spatial kinds of difficulties, and 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 certainly um, that's not something that we would necessarily expect to be specific to bipolar disorder. So so my my take on you know the effect of these time time zone changes would be that it, it it probably is something that that could interact with bipolar disorder, but I don't believe that we know enough to say that 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 people with bipolar disorder are particularly sensitive to those kinds of changes. Um, so so to to me, it sounds like it's more about the time change than about bipolar disorder. Um, but admittedly, I, I haven't seen a lot written on 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 that very important topic, especially if if it can be very uh, disorganizing for you know for some individuals. Mm, thank you. A question that came in from Twitter, and I think it's a really important one. It asks or states essentially. I think what this person's saying is when they're having very severe cognitive challenges, they're in a place where they're essentially unable to take any action at all. And so I'm wondering if you have any tips for people um, that they can use, you know, in preparation for those times, perhaps when they're in a very severe state, um, or things that they can do in advance of those periods that might help. Well, again, I think in part this question speaks to, you know, our, our important recognition that some of the cognitive difficulties, you know, are very closely related to symptoms and some may not be closely related to symptoms. And I assume that when, you know, when the writer sort of gets into a, a severe mood state perhaps, that, that I think that there is a lot of truth to the idea that, you know, it's difficult to mobilize any kind of cognitive resource to do anything. So I think in that type of situation, you know, the the immediate attention really should be placed on kind of stabilizing the mood so that we can get the person to a state where then they can kind of, you know, do the things that are necessary to, to focus on on, on the cognitive kinds of skills because I would anticipate that with the stabilization of a severe mood that that in itself is going to put the, pe the person in, in a better cognitive place if you will and um, because I, I do completely agree with the, the, uh, the writer of the question that um, you know when you're when you're in that type of state that you know, there's there's very little that 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 one can do. You know, when, when you're when you're so um, overwhelmed by by the mood and the associated cognitive problems that come with that. Thank you. And I think this is our last question, by the look of it. And the person asks, "Can you comment on the relationship between how I subjectively feel I'm doing in terms of my cognition and how I'm actually doing objectively?" Well, I'm, I'm actually glad that, that you bring this up because those are, you know, when we think about the complexity of cognition and, you know, all the different abilities that are that are a part of that and all the different components, some of which we've talked about uh, today, that, that one important aspect is that, you know, when we try to understand cognition, that it's important to take a perspective that, that takes into account different um, ways of looking at it, okay? And so, so there's this distinction between sub 
subjective cognitive functioning, which refers to the person's, the individual's perception of how their cognition is. Um, and, and then to contrast that with objective cognitive functioning, which is basically kind of an indicator of a person's cognitive functioning or memory functioning that's based on their performance on, on memory tests and things like that, okay, more sort of what you would call objective kinds of tests. And, you know, one of the interesting things that, that we're understanding is that, you know, sometimes the person's subjective accounts of their cognitive functioning, whether they, they're, they're perceiving that they have very good cognition or very poor cognition, is sometimes very accurate and it goes very hand in hand with what we, we um, are able to to measure from doing things like memory testing and so on. But in other instances, there could be a big discrepancy between these things. And, and so to give an example of that, there could be situations where a person might have the subjective feeling or beliefs that, that they have very poor memory. And yet we might bring this person to the lab and do memory testing and find that they're performing not just at an average level, but maybe at a high average level. Okay, and that would be a situation where, you know, it might be important to help, you know, first of all, give the person important feedback about their, their memory, objective memory skills, and to try to address, you know, why there might be such a discrepancy and, you know, is, is some of this coming from, from depression or, or other kinds of things. And, you know, sometimes it can just be very comforting to know that, you know, a person who perceives that they have very poor abilities, that they actually have fairly good skills. Um, the, the discrepancy between objective and subjective could also go in the other direction. So sometimes people might believe that they have very, very good skills, but then when it comes to the objective testing, we might find that there's actually some, some weaknesses or some difficulties that the person might be experiencing. And again, you know, trying to understand where these discrepancies come from and how we can address them. So, for example, you know, in, in the instance that I just described, we certainly wouldn't want somebody who, um, you know, believes that they can do things, that they can engage in things, um, and then they would actually, um, you know, try to try to engage in, in activities and then and then not have success because of, of cognitive difficulties, that that could be Again, something that would be worth, um, you know, working in the context of, of perhaps therapy or or just uh, treatment to try to, you know, get a handle on, on these kinds of discrepancies too. So, so I think you know the bottom line is that 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 it's always best to take a multiple perspective approach to trying to under, understand you know where where a person is in terms of their cognitive functioning. Mm. Yeah, I think that's very sage advice, just to remember that subjective and objective measures are not necessarily synonymous. Beautiful. Well, that's, sorry, that's the end of our uh, question and answer session. That was a really rich discussion, so thank you to everybody who was on the line who sent us those excellent questions in. A special thank you to Dr. Ivan Torres uh, for joining us today in that wonderful webinar. Thank you, Ivan. You're welcome, and thank you to all who participated and who asked these uh, incredibly um, important and good questions. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.